so much, Jagbir. Lovely introduction. And Thanks. so good of you to invite me. I think UPFA is a wonderful organization. Thank you. So, uh, first question, Professor Bachu. You yourself are an academic trained in the UK and established in the US now. You are a multiple migrant. How has your migration story contributed to your resilience and creative success? So, um, indeed, I, ha I do have an inheritance of movement. And the other thing is that I actually moved on my own. So I bring a, a, story, a different nuance to the story of twice migrants. You know, I come from a twice migrant background, but in fact, it's more than that. You know, when I wrote Twice Migrants, I was based in Britain. It was my PhD thesis work. Uh, which was published as a book. And uh, so, and that was looking at the, the ways in which people who move and do not have home orientation. I mean, twice migrants were not particularly home orientated in the sense that they were not interested in general, with exceptions, of course, in going back to India and to a country of origin. The vast majority of them were part of wherever they were. And also they brought enormous sophistication in you know, a management of minority status and social cultural skills that gave them an edge in the economies in which they settled. You know, at, at the time I was writing Twice Migrants, it was Britain. And the interesting thing is that if you looked at, uh, I mean, uh, not only the fact that they had these uh, a, a skill set. Women at the time when I did Enterprising Women, that book, which was in the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, twice migrant women entered the labor market in Britain, it was at 67%, which was the same as mainstream white women. It was, it was the group which did that. And so, uh, so twice migrants is very much the background I come from, but I, as I moved on, I realized in my current research that indeed it is a twice migrant background, but my grandfather and many men of his generation were already multiple migrants before they became multiple migrants. So, you know, my grandfather had gone from the Punjab to uh, Shanghai in, in China to Japan and worked in the shipyards of Yokohama and learned Jap very fine Japanese craftsman techniques and then moved to Malaysia. From Malaysia, moved to Basra in Iraq and then he moved to Kenya. So you see, I was not conscious of that background when I wrote Twice Migrants. And it, it really basically determines my life. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's a way of being in the world. It's a way of uh, organizing your life. It's an orientation. It's um, uh, a sensibility. It's, it's, uh, it's all those sorts of things. Uh, and, uh, and it's work, uh, that early work on Twice Migrants is something that I have carried on in the rest of my work, except that that concept has got uh, more advanced. And in my current book, I look at it through a technical, it's a cultural, but also the, it's got a twist of how, uh, how sophisticated their technical skills are to the point that they're defining 21st century landscapes. And that's basically invisible to people. Okay. So it was a pattern. It was a pattern that I was writing about at that time. But uh, then the book had its whole life in the US because it applied to the Armenians, to the Vietnamese, to the Chinese, to Jews of many groups. And that I was not conscious of at all when I wrote that. I mean, I was very British based. And uh, so from becoming a pattern, it's become a concept. You know, a concept captures many patterns. And I actually wrote an encyclopedia entry on twice migrants. So it's become more powerful as a concept rather than a pattern, which is what I thought, which is what I had written about at the time. Mm -hmm. So as you've just reflected, Twice Migrants was and is an important book nationally, but also internationally. Um, but can you just reflect a little bit more on the significance of twice migrants within the UK context, um, particularly with reference to cultural 
identity and maintenance um, uh, within the UK context? It's, you know, within the UK context, it's, I mean, that's, that's where this concept emerged. Uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD, it was obvious to me that people who had uh, come from East Africa, by the time they moved to Britain, they've already had something like a 70 year period of uh, being in East Africa. Therefore, they, had, they knew how they had developed an infrastructure there. They had uh, very, good uh, very good community connections. They were, uh, so they were skilled. They were skilled not at the management, only at the management of minority status, but also in reproducing those infrastructural skills in a new setting. So if you, I mean, there was a class component too, because they had, uh, also a certain level of wealth and education and so on and so forth. But more, more than those two categories, they had lived as a diasporic community before they moved. And therefore they really diasporized. They, they, it was not new for them to have moved from a country of origin to, to another place. Uh, they, they brought that capital with them. And if you see I mean, a lot of the, the Mandla versus Lee case, which defined the six as a race, I mean, that was led by an East African uh, solicitor. I mean, it was all those uh, many fights to uh, establish uh, an identity uh, was, was actually led by this group. So in lots of ways they had, uh, they had the skills to establish the community, but also to negotiate beyond that with the mainstream community. They just had more of those skills, skills that people who came directly, their children are developing in very big ways too, but there is a, there's a time difference. So by this stage, that twice migrant group is, has been in the diaspora for something like 120 years. Uh, and so there were those kinds of, uh, I mean, there were very key differences, the making of gurdwaras, Gurdwaras were there, but the, the efficiency of organization often came from this particular group. And people often comment on that. Uh, also, the Punjabi suit, uh, you know, which I wrote about the design and the design economies, that, that was also led by women from the twice migrant community. Uh, the woman who dresses Bobby Mahil, who dressed Theresa May and Sherry Booth in a suit. This, this was not designed in India, it was designed by a twice migrant group. They were, they were, they were culturally and ethnically more assertive and less willing to cut their hair and wore a turban, just in the same way the women wore a Punjabi suit in very stylish ways. You remember at the time when Diana Spencer, Princess Diana and the, the Duchess of York's daughter was wearing a Punjabi suit at the time. There was a whole movement and uh, it was led by an, almost entirely by twice migrant women or yeah. progeny of twice migrants. Right. So it was, you know, it's in the realm of design, it's the realm of culture, it's community organization. They brought certain skills and, and that, you know, including negotiating at, uh, at the level of uh, uh, very serious legal fights. I mean, there were other people involved, but but uh, 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 twice migrants were a little more prominent. Yeah. Okay. So in your new book, Movers and Makers, you discuss how, in your words, culturally dexterous movers and makers are skilled at the management of their minority status and possess durable technical and cultural capital which has roots in ancient Punjab and has been advanced and catalyzed with every migration to define the new and the ascendant in the contemporary world. Can you tell us uh, which two or three of these movers and shakers in your new book stand out to you and why? So um, uh, it's actually, uh, um, it, so as twice migrants moved, uh, and remember, I've just said there were more than twice migrants. I mean, I, some of us just didn't know that our grandparents have a wonderful history of moving and taking risks. And I think that if uh, what was surprising to me is the number of people I, I wrote about and interviewed, uh, how much they uh, 
appreciate the fact that the grandparents took big risks because they say they can take a higher level of risk. So there was a great deal of admiration. So, uh, so there are a number of people who really stand out. Um, in fact, all, all the people I write about stand out. I mean, this is why I was, um, there's always a bias in the sense that you're attracted to the people whose work resonates with you and who, whose life stories are interesting. So the stories that I tell, uh, uh, the, ver the very obvious one, which shows how move, what I refer to as movement capital, the ability to move and to be culturally dexterous and to be technically dexterous, dexterous is somebody like uh, Sir Tejinder Professor uh, Vidhi, who is a physicist. And there he is, there's a photograph of him standing in front of the Large Hadron Collider. He was a founding father of uh, of this uh, this is uh, the cathedral to science it's called um, and I'll talk about him in a little uh, I'll talk about him uh, in a while and there are people like Amarjit Kalsi who is the uh, it was an architect who died not long ago and he was one of the designers of Terminal Five at Heathrow Airport the Court of Human European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg the law court in Bordeaux, Brachas Airport, and so on and so forth. So, but, uh, uh, you know, there was a slide of the corrugated iron temples. And uh, let me just tell you something about the reason why I'm so interested in the corrugated iron temples. You know, can you bring up the slide, which was the first one of the temples? Because what I want to uh, what I want to, when I started this book, a friend of mine, Professor Les Back at Goldsmiths, told me that my story is really about the building of these temples and the ways in which the progeny of these people who built these temples using very scarce materials are exactly the people who are now leading scientific experiments, you know, key and making key architectural buildings and leading, um, defining artistic landscapes, etc. So it's that trajectory that I trace precisely because you've been part of the pioneering communities where you really had to get together and uh, share your skills to develop the infrastructure with scarce materials, that this, this is precisely the group that's later emerged in the 21st century. So the Large Hadron Collider, where the CMS experiment took place, which is one of the detectors, is a um, uh, is a huge um, it's a gargantuan uh, uh, scientific um, uh, you know it's it's a, it's the it's the cathedral to science as it's called in which the god particle was found and so it is a uh, project of uh, one of the most powerful instruments made and Tijin Davidi was the founding father with two Germans, two French guys and when they started people told them that they were mad. It's their ability to work with the new and discover the new is an aspect of this story. So he worked with, I mean, they, they, this was uh, in Geneva uh, at CERN, the, the Center for Nuclear uh, research, that's uh, something like that. So this was the Large Hadron Collider is, uh, is you know, uh, was produced by 3,500 3, scientists, 45 countries, you know, it really pushed technology to the limits, a project of extreme engineering. And the CMS, the, the, uh, the, the particle accelerator, the detector uh, in which the Higgs boson, the God particle was found, is the most a uh, complex scientific instrument ever made, and it was considered to be this, uh, you know, one of the, um, the major scientific discovery of its time, of our times, um, uh, and so, so th that is one of the people I've written about. Uh, and the other person is uh, somebody like Amarjit Kalsi, who is an architect. He had one. He was at the age of thirty was director with. Uh, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, um, and he he he, I see he was a, he was the person behind very key European iconic uh, buildings, and he had wonderful skills of drawing, 
of drawing in the moment. When he died, his obituary was all about his magical drawing skills. He just used a rotary pen. And the significance of, for example, the slide that's on, uh, on, on the, which you can see is one of the drawings of the pump room is one that Amuja did when he was 20 at the Architectural Association. So, and, and then he goes on to do many other things. And so uh, the point of this is that the, this group has the ability to work with the new and to generate the new without paying attention to what is status quo, or what is conventional, or what is already there. And Amarjit had the ability, as, as you, some, a project was being discussed, he had the ability to draw and conceptualize it. Often the building was basically how he conceptualized it early on. And then I also wrote about the artist Pajan Honjan, who uh, designed, uh, worked on the center of Slough Square. Uh, you can see the uh, the floorscape for that. And he, she designed the pontoon on Rivoli for the Olympics, the Olympic Park. And what she has is the ability to, like the people, the pioneers of the corrugated iron temples, the ability to work with materials in the most daring way. I refer to her chapter as material daring because she, whereas most artists work with about four to five materials, she works for over 25 and she has the ability to deal with materials in a way that is really quite exceptional in the sense that she works with cement, which is considered to be a masculine material. So her work is rendered by architectural and engineering firms. And so you see, it's not only she pioneering the way in she works in her use of materials, but in the kind of work that she does too. And many people know about the Singh twins, uh, who's, uh, uh, who's, who, you know, who have recontextualized, reinvented the Mughal miniatures. And they have done that despite enormous odds when they started doing this method of art. Uh, this, is the, this is a painting that I really like because it captures migration. You can see uh, their grandmother. Uh, I mean, it's really the story of migration and, and also uh, Britain. And you know, they're now, called, now referred to as, as the new artistic face of Britain, but to get there, they did it against enormous odds because people thought that this was a method of painting that really did not fit into any classificatory system. And nobody was doing this kind of work and they fought for a lifetime. And so those are kind of four uh, people really who uh, I'm very struck by. And in every case, it's, it's nothing is easy. Whilst these are stories uh, at some level of having made it, it is done despite enormous odds, you know, really uh, having to, uh, they really needed the courage over a very long time and take very high level risks. And, you know, in lots of ways you pay a price for that risk. And, but it's we also within that those very difficult domains, there are also people who broke through to create new ways of making, doing, creating, so on and so forth. Yeah, so you just mentioned there that they uh, took risks. Um, and in your book, you focus on the concept of resilience in the stories of these migrants. Um, can you, I, I suppose, unpack that notion of resilience and, do, and uh, thinking about it, what was the impact of race, but also one's own culture on um, making a position and um, developing resilience? So I think that if you're a mover, uh, resilience is, has to be fundamentally part of what you are, or you build it. And how you do that is that whenever you move, you're not really part of a familiar economy. You know, you, there aren't established networks of power. You're not the power elite, so to speak. There's no, no social structure, no cultural structure, no networks that can buttress what you're about. Nothing undergirds what migrants often do. Of course, 
a key thing is that they bring certain skills and those skills are around in the cultures that they're part of, the, you know, the toolkits that they have, which are both technical and cultural and so on and so forth. And so, so when uh, resilience is so much a hot topic of our times, uh, you know, in these uncertain times. So I talk about this notion of movement capital, which is a facet of migrant, you know, of being multiple migrants. But movement capital is something that migrants have because migration is a very big risk. You know that only 3.4% of the world moves. 97, almost 97% of the world never moves because it is very high risk. You have to be, you have to have certain courage and, and already I think because you have decided to move, you already have some dimension of resilience there. Most people want to stay within whatever is familiar. I mean, despite the virulent anti-immigration narrative which politicians uh, exploit, very few people in the world move. And so, so I suggest that the people who have moved multiply uh, have a uh, have a kind of resilience which comes and it's developed precisely because they have moved and had to set up all over again. But also, I have focused on resilience because there's a personal uh, happening which made me uh, highlight it more than I might have done. I mean, it became central to my life because I lost my house in a fire in 2015. So that made, uh, really made me focus on what is it that made people's, people survive. I mean, I literally walked out of the house with, with two minutes time with you know, on a very cold icy day without a coat, without any shoes, uh, a pair of socks and so on, and re rebuilt my life and also rebuilt this uh, book because I lost everything. So that extreme disruption in my life, which can be devastating, made me think a great deal about resilience. And so resilience is this is, is a facet of uh, of kind of elasticity so you know uh, there uh, uh, and rizzoli talks about pyramids pyramids have a lot of strength but when a pyramid collapses it cannot do anything more it just collapses but the notion of resilience is that you move and you adapt to new circumstances and you don't think you're going to go back to the past or how you were before, but you operate in a new domain and the contours of those domains are not clear to you at all. So you, you have the ability to take a risk and to follow a path which has not been discovered and which you discover in the moment as you go along. And so that is the notion of resilience, which not only twice migrants, but I think immigrants possess. Because you move, there's already something about you. And I think that resilience actually develops over uh, the more you move because you know somebody else. I mean, uh, as I say, people so admire the ones I've talked to, their grandparents, and precisely because they moved and they survived. Uh, and so they already have an element or a, a sensibility which says that they can take risks and they will survive despite the odds and despite enormous dis disequilibrium and the cards being loaded against you. So, so, so there was a personal thing, but also, um, uh, you know, migrants are, are resilient at the beginning and they advance that capital. Right, thank you. Um... You, no you note in the book how these multiple migrants are generous, inclusive, and deeply collaborative. That their Punjabi migrant style of being in the world is defined by the powerful concepts drawn from the Sikh religion um, of Sarbat Dabala and Vandika Shekhana. Can we expand and explore this? Um, and I think I would also uh, uh, like to explore Bhajan's work, particularly in um, the Slav um, image that you had of the openness and welcoming of all. 
um, so what would you how, how would you what would you like to say about that so I think when you looked at this image earlier, once we had a conversation, you said it reminded you of the Golden Temple and the various gates. I mean, the, the temples are, our temples are open, you know, in a very, uh, in a way that everybody is welcome. So uh, this is Pajin's uh, drawing, I mean, Pajin's floorscape, which is kind of, uh, it, it's kind of evocative of Sarbatta Pala. I mean, Sarbatta Pala is such a wonderful concept, and it's one that that came up again and again uh, in in you know um, th that was referred to by by a number of people who I spoke to. The, uh, so there's uh, not only do you see this in the way she has interpreted the floorscape, but she also works with Bangladeshi women, the teams that she works with when, you know, I mean, these these uh, floorscapes or the, the, the work that she designed is rendered by a team of people, architects and engineers and uh, negotiating with local authorities. I mean, the ability to work with a range of people is similar to the ways in which Tajinda worked with 3,500 uh, scientists from 45 countries. It, it's very deeply rooted. And Sunit Tuli, uh, who we have, we have a video of him. Sunit Tuli is the person who was behind the, the $50 uh, handheld device, which does everything that an iPad does, but doesn't look as good, but is very, is um, he uh, is, is something that's accessible to people at $50. Most people in the world cannot buy a $400 to $600 iPad. And he actually explicitly refers to Sarbatta Pala, that whenever he's always asked, you know, he was the, chosen as the 15 most um, influential educational entrepreneurs by Forbes magazine. And he says that, and he's always asked about whether he's trying to break Steve Jobs' monopoly. He always says he doesn't care about Steve Jobs' monopoly. What he's trying to do is to bring computing power to the billions. Could you have a slide okay. of him? Uh, uh, so he's, he's, well, he's one of them. But the notion of Sarbatta Pala is uh, it's you know you can see that the ways in which uh, Sikh Gurdwaras have responded to you know these oxygen lungers where oxygen has been made available to anyone and everyone and uh, you know the, uh, and also uh, I say in the book that it is very similar this very in, it's very in sync with the 21st century notion of shareism you know which is uh, something that Isaac Mao who's part of the Free Souls Movement at MIT, who is a venture capitalist, talks about shareism. It's exactly like Sarbatta Pala, Vandike Chukana, um, and all those sorts of very powerful, both cultural and religious concepts that are referred to on an everyday basis. You know, I mean, Sarbatta Pala is the last line of the Ardas. And so shareism is a kind of, he says, it's a mind switch. And that it's it's a revolutionary. And what he is talking about, the notion of shareism is that that you share your knowledge, your resources, and that that actually means that there is collective intelligence and this collective um, sharing of 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 resources, of knowledge, of material, of democratizing knowledge, which is what open source technology is about you know when tim bernard lees was uh, um uh, he did the internet uh, opened up the internet that was part of the democratizing process but sh shareism sarbatta pala is exactly what it is so that notion is very in sync with 21st century digital technologies it is all about open source crowdsourcing and you know uh, all that uh, these very powerful 21st century notions and the this uh, this old very highly developed notion of sarbatta pala vandke chakna which which punjabi's uh, six in particular are very uh, inducted into really are in sync with the moment and in sync with the times 
And many of the people I'm writing about actually really subscribe to that. But Sudeet does it explicitly. Uh, and also Kuljeet, who's made uh, the Kuljeet Bamra, who is a um, uh, who is a tabla player and music producer, uh, also does that. You know, he feels that knowledge about the tabla sh should not be within a guild guru system, but they should be available to everyone. And he's invented a, an electric electronic tabla and has also uh, anyone who can read musical notes can play the tabla and you know it's uh, he's broken the monopolies of knowledge and I all that open sourcing shareism is exactly what Sarbatta Palaz is the most powerful concept in the world which is now in vogue in other domains of science culture technology uh, you know pedagogic participative pedagogy that you teach people and and, and so um, whoever think, invented it it was a genius i think um with reference to your discussion of um rishi rich um and the relationship between jay sean uh, um the um uh, singer songwriter and how that sharing of knowledge between them got them to where it got them their success yes it wasn't that they did it in isolation but it was by working together and sharing the skill set would you like to expand on that a little bit yes i, I think that's another example of uh it's a kind of organic hybridity you know it, it's the way in which they came together rishi had the technical skills, just in the same way that Kuljeet had technical skills and was so much behind making Bhangra music go transnational, but in the ways in which he, he produced, engineered that music. And in lots of ways, Rishi doesn't see himself as an engineering of music, but he's an engineering engineer of sound. And Rishi was already established when he met Jay Sean. And Nachna uh, Tirinal, which is one of the songs that went into uh you know they came together on this song and they it was literally produced and created by sharing by uh by negotiating by coming together with these uh, their different skills and, and and so you know this is how jay sean was produced uh with club in collaboration to rishi so rishi was very critical to Jay Sean when they made it into, I think, in the top of the pops. They weren't at the top, but they were within the range in which they were noticed. And this is what got Jay Sean his contract, the first contract with, I think, Virgin Records. Uh, and then he goes on to become a very big star as the, I think, after Freddie Mercury, who was, as some of you know, uh, was from Zanzibar, was also a twice migrant. You see how they all in the world of music and design and science and architecture. So uh, uh, with Fre Freddie Mercury, I think Jay Sean was uh, hit the Billboard 100, you know, the top, the top of it. And he moves to the US, uh, he's produced by a US company because he's already become well known. But it was absolutely a, a collaborative, uh, negotiative uh, way of working, which produces a new, and it was a new sound. And that's not there now when it went into these very high level domains, came out of working in the moment. I think the, the thing that I emphasize all the time, the, the, there is, when you move into a new place, there is the ability to capture the new on the basis of the new, because you don't say in India or wherever we came from, we did things this way, and that is the way we're going to reproduce in a new, in a new destination. Uh, I think their real power lies behind the fact that you respond to the moment and you create in the moment and in creating in the moment you discover the new and the contours of the new without knowing without navigating existing routes you see this in i i, I worked on this in dangerous designs where uh, uh, very high level designers from india opened up shops in london but their shops did not succeed and yet the shops of london women who were negotiating the suit of the design the design of the suit in um, 
in the moment, you know, well, what do you want? And should we have this color and that embroidery? So it was a, well, I know I refer to it as co-construction and this co-construction where you capture the moment in the moment in the same way as Amarjit Kalsi was able to capture that within the, within a very simple drawing. Uh, that that's really powerful because you don't then say, well, you know, this our ancients did it this way, and therefore we we will just carry on that pattern, and in that lies their power. Um, and I suppose one of the things that uh, when you're talking about shared shared knowledge, um, well-being of all. Uh, um, what I'm reflecting on is how when early migrants came to the UK, for example, um, how women, uh, particularly first migrant women um, uh, who came directly from Punjab, um, uh, might not have had a lot of the skill sets. But when in the company of twice migrants, women were helped along in terms of developing that skill set, for example, in terms of making salwar kameez or pre preparing food. So there was all that kind of knowledge sharing to help within the community for one to be established. Do you want to explore some of that dynamic? Yes, yes. I, I, think, I think that, um, I think this, uh, uh, the reason I find that corrugated iron um, image so interesting is because when people made that, it was like everybody had to, you know, bring their own skill. And uh, so one of the things about uh, these people also was, so it, it wasn't only applied to one domain, it applied to many domains. So, I mean, th these pioneers could do anything and everything, you know, so I give examples of like these men who knew, uh, who knew how to, um, there was Lord Egerton and a British colonial arist aristocrat whose planes, whose plane, a part of the plane broke and, uh, one of the uh, uh, the people in my grandfather's generation looked at this part and re re and made it very quickly. Otherwise, he would have had to wait for the part to come from Europe. And this that this ability to look at things and and reproduce them was very common. And they taught it to other people. There was a great in any pioneering community, and it's not exclusive to the Punjabis because if you look at American pioneering people. David McAuliffe's wonderful book on pioneers, it's exactly the same ethos. I know something, it was, you know, the, the defining thing of, of migrant communities is kam sikho te kam sakao, which is kind of linked to Sirbatta Pala, Vandake Chako. It's the same aspect, Vando and kam sikho te kam sakao. What you know, you don't keep to yourself. If you are an elite, your tendency will be this is our knowledge and we're going to maintain it through elite universities, elite circuits of power, elite circuits of, so that nobody else finds out. And we, the, we, the people from Eton or Harvard, et cetera, can just keep that knowledge to ourselves and everybody else can, you know, sort of go away. So this, I mean, of course, there is a sick dimension to it, but there's also a pioneering community dimension to it. And it applied to the men, it applied to, to the women. And for example, there was, um, as you said, uh, you know, uh, it, it was passed on to women who were not twice migrants because twice migrant women, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about is that the technical capital that they carry is enormous. Just like the men carry this huge technical capital, which advanced with every migration, uh, the women also carry. So in in uh, East Africa, women drove pickup trucks, and you know they could make doors, and um, they can, could run lathe machine machines. So the sex sexual division of labor loosened. And you see this in pioneering American women, Barbara Stanwyck in Hollywood films drives a combine harvester. It's my favorite image, you know, on the farms, they could do these things. And so the women could do that too. So I remember in the 1960s, the chust pajama was very popular, you know, those those churidars that Nehru used to wear too. And, and that, that's not an easy thing to make because it's not cut like a salvar. 
but it's you have to sew the material on the bias and then cut it. So one woman knew, I'm giving you a sewing lesson along with all the other stuff. And she taught, she taught us and then we taught other people. And we used to wear the chust pajama in a very stylish way with the top, which you'd make according to the fashion codes of the time. You know, we used to use simplicity and, and uh, style and vogue patterns and make the top in you know in a in a very fashion coded way and wear the chust pajama but you saw how one person knew and then she taught the others and so so because of that uh, way of one uh, the shareism thing it's 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 passed on to everyone it's it's something that you regardless of caste creed etc you just uh, is something you pass on. And, and when you pass on things, this kind of radical openness, it means that the knowledge pool increases enormously. The key thing that people of the, the people who, who develop this notion of shareism is that they, the, the, the more you share, the more it gets shared. And you know, Wikipedia and all these open source licensing domains are exactly about that, that there's a multiplication of knowledge. I remember you were telling me that your, your mother was taught uh, something by somebody who's from a twice migrant background who knew how to do, how to make, uh, how to cut and make, uh, Soups, make a, a suit, et cetera. So that, that whole, I mean, that's in the, the microcosm you are describing is yeah. something that is predominant and actually defines uh, how you are in the world and it's a generous way of being it's a, it's this notion of bridging capital you make bridges yes. and that making of bridges increases both the technical capital but also the cultural skills and also sophisticates the community in general and that's the that's a real power of uh, shareism and and yes. and all these sorts of notions Yes, I think one of the uh, important things within these migration processes, um, particularly with reference to the women, uh, learning from one another and sharing that knowledge. Um, as you've mentioned, my mother uh, learned how to make um, salwar kameez when we were little from our neighbor who was an East African Sikh. But um, the skill set that my mom shared with auntie was um, how to knit because uh, um, so there's different skill sets that people bring along. I think like a lot of the Punjabi Sikh women, uh, the first migrants, then you had to make berries, um, do the embroidery and everything, while they probably didn't have this skill knowledge of um, making the salwar kameez, et cetera. So they learned, they shared that knowledge to, yes. um, uh, in a sense, it, it was also a, a survival mechanism because yes. of finances and resources. It was, it was absolutely a survival mechanism. I think that the reason that these women who came from uh, East Africa had that because really, I mean, they could also make dharis and, you know, they, I'm an embroiderer and crochet. And, you know, we were all, we were always told we couldn't sit around with the hands free. You had to be working with your hands somehow, you know, you can watch TV, but you have to be doing something, crocheting, knitting, something or the other. Uh, but this also, uh, uh, comes from the fact that it was a needs-based economy. I mean, if you wanted your men dressed in your, to have sheets in your house and your children to have their uniforms and the salwar kameez and every, everything that needed to be worn, you needed to have the skill to make it. And because they had to do it, and there was no service economy as there is in India, you know, tailors and halwais, and you, you knew your domestic skills were at a very high level. And it, they also became more advanced because people shared exactly this very thing you explained, that one knew something and the other one knew something else. And so this is this notion of collective knowledge, which is reflected the way in which Tejinda worked at the highest levels of science and technology, the way in which Pajan works, the way in which, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, basically all the people I write about have that, aesthetic and it gets advanced when two women came together and one knew how to sew and the other came out and they're two skill sets coming together to make a, a more advanced level third skill set and that's exactly one of the things that 
is very significant about multiple migrants. Uh, and it's something that uh, Ricardo Hausmann talks about at Harvard. He says that when people, firstly, innovation comes from the outside often. And the, the multiple migrants are the most innovative people in the world. Uh, I mean, I don't mean just Punjabis. It is um, in the current time, the Moderna vaccine, the person behind it is Nufar Af Afian Nubar, who is Armenian from Beirut to Montreal to Boston. His company flagship pioneering is behind the Moderna vaccine. So the most critical crisis of our times, the solution comes from an immigrant. Similarly, the people behind Pfizer, the BioNTech, two Turkish doctors, also migrants. Then people like Jeff Bezos, Cuban immigrant, Steve Jobs, Armenian father, um, you know, both uh, uh, an immigrant background. And Johnny Ive, the design guru, behind Apple products, the most cutting edge, an immigrant whose father was a uh, silversmith uh, from a craftsman background and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 Sergey Brin of Google, from Russian math uh, mathematics professors, you know, his, that's what his parents are. And so, and then Walter Gropius who defines the, who, who is uh, behind the Bauhaus movement, the most powerful design movement. I mean, it's, uh, you know, his biographer says, he determines the world we live in, the furniture, the objects, the, the, uh, the, the ways in which uh, the, the typography, uh, all these people come from that kind of background. Uh, and so it, it's uh, very significant. So uh, Ricardo Hausmann says that as you migrate, you already have something. And then that gets you develop that in new ways. It becomes more complex. But it's not like what people say, well, immigrants have just come to live off our countries. It's because they bring a huge amount of capital to these countries of various types. And Punjabi migrants did exactly the same. As you know, Punjab was already highly technically skilled before uh, before people were chosen from this background. You know, the, the Harappans were there 2,600 years ago, which is a very cutting edge metallurgy, irrigation, all that develops from there. And then the British noticed that Punjabis were very hardworking and they carried a very high level of skill. The Persian wheel had been in use in the Punjab 900 years before it became into general use south of Delhi. And, you know, Kipling's father, John Yard Kipling started a arts and crafts school because they noticed there was already very high level of skill and that was then professionalized through uh, um, a technical education and so on and so forth. So the story goes on. But you know, but I, as, as, as we talked earlier, I think the, the most of us don't think of the capital that women carry and it's equivalent to that of the men in a different domain, but it is it is very high level of capital, which is which is shared in the same way as men shared. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Professor Bachu. Um, we've got a number of questions um, for you, and I will start off. And if anybody has any questions they would like to ask live, if you would just um, signal by raising your hand um, and we will get to you. But I've got just a couple of questions that have come through. And, and the first one is, how and why did you choose those you wrote about in your book? So I, I, I actually, I think they chose me. <laughs> uh, when I started this research, which was really quite a long time ago, uh, I think 15 years ago, uh, there were a number of people I, I, I interviewed. You know, there were people who were behind the Goodness Gracious program, the producer at the BBC. There were various others. And then, uh, I, you know, so I'm not, I, although I work, in, I, I have worked with sociologists, I'm an anthropologist. So a lot of my work is ethnographically grounded and based on cases. So I chose these people because I think I liked, I, I, I obviously I liked what they did, but I also found it very admirable. 
that they were able to do the work that they were able to do following paths that were really difficult and also uh, paths that all of us know about you know it's it's the way in which a lot of us worked in very racist domains and we still do that and you it was despite not having um, you know the the power domains that often undergird innovation and so on and so forth so i think i chose the people because i um, i had um, i found i found decoding the ways in which they did their work the process of their of how they came into doing what they did and i'm very interested in life stories and i found their lives very interesting so so i think that uh, that is how i chose them it's not some random sample of you know a thousand people of which i chose 20 but i had also been following many of their works i think the sing twins i think i followed them for something like over a decade so you know it was it was a very long term project in which uh, you know was hanging around their studios not the sing twins but uh, Pajan Hunjan and various other people. And in, in some cases, uh, people told me that I should write about someone. I think I was not into science and technology. And somebody persuaded me that I should write about Tijin Dadi, who was doing very interesting work. And that's how I came to it. Mm -hmm. so there is no particular logic to it. OK, um, we've got a couple of hands up. Um, would Dilji Bachu like to ask a question? Yes, I would very much. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Professor Bachu. Um, not least because seeing seeing my name with Professor next to it is definitely um, inspiring yeah. as, a, as an academic myself. Um, and, and just thank you again for your email reply. Um, the other day. Um, so I'm quite interested, well actually first just on the note of, of the people you mentioned, it was also really really welcomed um, and lovely to see that you covered Justine Kaur, um, a dear friend of mine, because actually in Scotland, you know, being, being Scottish Punjabi um, in the UK context, um, are often overlooked kind of being um, away from the, the English hubs of South Asian communities and having that recognition I think um, as Scots is, is really, really important. Um, and that brings me, I guess, to my question, thinking about the, um, the intersectional experiences um, across gender, caste, um, and thinking about wider South Asian communities, I guess something I'm quite conscious of um, from my own experiences in um, the UK creative industries um, and also programming South Asian arts is around how our dominance as a Punjabi community um, and how our recognition and status um, perhaps overshadows other groups and presents our um, white colleagues with a, an impression, I guess, that we are, we, we represent South Asian identity. Um, I think it's one of the risks of, of being a dominant, a dominant, I guess, a majority minority for a, for a dominant group in there. Um, and, and so how, I guess, do you have your own reflections or thoughts on, on how our dominance as a twice migrant community and the progress we've made, um, how that intersects and, and relates with um, other South Asian communities, whether that's along lines of um, different caste communities um, or from other parts of um, South Asia, for example, South Indian communities um, who are perhaps minority minorities. Um, and I guess thinking about that question in the context of how we provide more nuanced accounts of representation in, yeah. in a world where we are still minorities. And so we're battling that sort of being dominant within um, how we're viewed, um, but trying to show um, our colleagues that there is more nuance, that there are several other underrepresented groups um, and I guess getting away from the problem of um, Punjabi men dominating everything, I guess, is, is one of my particular experiences in the music industry, um, that it's very, very hard to find women. Um, yeah. 
Well, you know, uh, hi, Diljeet. I know we share a surname and it's a very, it's not a common last name. So I was really <laughs> t- taken aback because I always think you can count the butchers on, on the finger, <laughs> fingers of your hand. Uh, so, you know, it also depends on the context. For example, uh, um, as I, I mentioned early on, that uh, having moved myself, you know, without uh, without a network, um, uh, I have a different view of migration because in the U.S., it's a case that um, um, very elite people from India, you know, Brahmins, Bengalis, mm-hmm. dominate the academy, dominate tech. The head of Google, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, Sundar Pichai, the head of uh, Microsoft, um, um, Satya Naida, uh, Indra Nui, who breaks the glass ceiling and is CEO of Pepsi. Uh, so when I am here, it's uh, it's the case that it's not the Punjabis who dominate; it's the South Indians who dominate. Tamil Brahmins, in particular, Tam Brahms, as they. I, 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 that's very interesting because that's what I've married into. <laughs> so, oh, married. so so I think so. You know, so it depends on the context, but I I think the 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 uh, but even here they say the South Indians say that Punjabis are so outgoing. I mean, I know somebody who organizes weddings and she says their weddings in terms of uh, conspicuous consumption and the uh, the dancing and the parties, she says Punjabis are like nobody else. So it's not just the, uh, the Punjabis dominate in Britain. It's the case that Punjabis dominate in music, they dominate in Bollywood, they dominate the ways in which celebrations and dinners and weddings are done. And, and she tells me that uh, no, they never ask you how much it's going to be as South Indians do. They just, you know, they just give with, uh, with enormous uh, amounts of generosity. So, but I think in the British case, you know, it's a case by the time uh, twice migrants arrive in Britain, they already have certain skills. Mm-hmm. And it is the case that when you already come highly skilled in, uh, we, you know, in a, with a capital that is to do with movement, then it, it's, uh, you know, you're just out there much more. You're, uh, it's a bit like the Jews in New York where uh, they come as craftsmen and they're grocers and leather makers and furriers and so on and so forth. Their children within the 30 year period, which is very short, are a lead in the professions. And that's also happened to Punjabis. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that, but one, but it's absolutely the case that people need to have a nuanced understanding. In this book, I tell a particular story and it's also linked to my long-term trajectory of multiple migrations. And I also tell this story because I think it's invisible. It really annoys me that Trump can say all immigrants are rapists and Boris Johnson does that too. With the immigrant story, immigrants are, the immigrant discourse is virulent and and it is about creating fear and so on and so forth. Yet the, uh, you know, immigrants uh, contribute 10% to GDP. The most number in the patents for innovation are held by immigrants, including you see the way in which the response to COVID Mm. has been from lead led by immigrants and so on and so forth. So I think that's the story I want to tell because I think it's invisible to the world in the way in which immigrants are, are presented. So I think I have a political agenda behind this. This is not to negate the stories of people who are not making it at that level. So my, the, way, the reason for my, the ways in which I have slanted this is also to do with the fact that immigrants add to the economies. They add in a way that locals benefit. And there's lots of research on that. So in fact, Thomas Friedman, the triple Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, uh, who has who writes in the New York Times says that people should develop an immigrant sensibility, a sensibility that 
tells you that nothing is given to you. Everything has to be fought for and that you don't have a legacy space at Ivy League universities like Harvard, et cetera, that you need to operate in a world in which you have to, you have to learn to live with the skills that you generate. And I think that that's very critical to, to my agenda. Mm -hmm. But I'm very conscious of the fact that there are many immigrants who do not make it at the level at which multiple migrants do. And it's not only Punjabi multiple migrants, as I've mentioned, Walter Gropius, all these, you know, whether it's uh, Carlos Slim behind the, the, the cell phone giant, you know, he's Lebanese, Maronite, Christian, moves to Moscow, Mexico. That pattern, Tesla, Nikola Tesla's life story, I simply love. You know, he goes, for, he goes from Europe to, to Britain, to France, to, to the US, that, that there's something about the multiple migrant trajectory, which gives you powers of innovation. Not only does it give you power of innovation, it, it's these people are defining the 21st century in such powerful ways that it's invisible to the world. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Terminal 5, you don't assume this is designed by the, des the design person behind that is, um, is Amarjit Kalsi. And similarly, you mentioned, mentioned Jocelyn. I mean, she is simply wonderful in the ways in which she uses material and uh, the product design. Her products are available in department stores, but it's also like Pajan Hunjan, her ability to use materials in multiple ways in a way, in a way that disrupts the system, but is also very sustainable. Uh, and so on and so forth. The notion of jugad, which is that you do things, it's frugal engineering, but you do, you rejig things and you use things that are already around in, in, uh, in many other ways. Uh, I think that all that is very significant. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And then um, we'll compare family trees. I'm sure I've got much, <laughs> many, many more questions to, to discuss. Um, and I think there's something to be said for strength in numbers as well. Perhaps it's the waves and the size of the waves of migration, um, yes. you know, that, that plays into that. But thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to reading the book. Thank you, Dildeep. Um, the next question is from Satwinda Semi. Would you like to ask your question live, please? Hi, afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk and introducing some names that I'm familiar with that most of the audience weren't familiar with. The question I have is basically that artistic and intellectual achievement or excellence is not generally recognized by the diaspora. Monetary achievement is a benchmark. Yes. You know, I'm wondering how many people actually were aware of the names that were mentioned on the flyers that Yupka sent out without having to look them up on Google search, you know, you might be one of the 10 best in your field in the world, but our people do not care. They don't want to know. Well, I think, I think that, I think that that's uh, a dilemma uh, that many new immigrant communities face where um, creative capital, intellectual work, you know, and I trained as an anthropologist, and uh, I mean, so did Jagbir. I mean, you know, it was something that was unheard of. I hadn't heard of it. I mean, it's not something, it's true. It is not, it is not knowledge that's valorized because I think what yeah. is given very high valence are the doctors, the dentists, the- Exactly, yeah, arrest my case the on The lawyers that. and the uh, pharmacists and the opticians. I mean, these are obvious vocations and, you know, I mean, I think that uh, some of us, some of the paths that some of us follow are both risky and it takes courage. And, uh, and people say all kinds of things about it. I think they don't understand, but equally, I don't think people understood uh, what a physicist does, somebody like Tejinder, you know, I don't think people, uh, I mean, I think that many new immigrant communities have exactly that, that the admiration is reserved for obvious vocations, which, you know, you go and see a doctor, you see an optician, you see a pharmacist, it's all first generation immigrant professions that are admired. It's exactly the same amongst uh, 
the Jews who came here in the early part of the 19th century, you know, I mean, being a doctor was really admired. And I think that precisely because the communities we come from don't understand it, don't admire it, don't know why you did it. Uh, it's something that, I mean, I actually don't know what to do other than I have to do what I have to do. But it's also the case that I also had to move because the British Academy was not open. The opportunity structure was for some of us an earlier generation was closed. So, you know, we had uh, multiple burdens to negotiate. I mean, I don't think that I personally uh, had any choice but to move. Uh, and I think uh, in lots of ways, movement is good, you know. I mean, I have wonderful quotes in the book where people say that staying put, uh, Theodore White says that staying in one place and not moving is like an everlasting disease because movement makes you innovative. You have to start all over again. But in all these cases, I'm not telling a story. I'm not describing people whose life, lives have been easy. They have been difficult. They've had to negotiate yeah. obstacles that, um, that are very hard. And you know, you know that overall, they say that immigrants have very high level of blood pressure, diabetes, because no there, is, there is a health price to pay for following, for not doing the conventional things, for not doing the status quo things. Yet you have to do what you have to do and live on your own terms. You cannot live on somebody else's terms. They will always be better at it than you are gonna be. So I think mm. that some of us, <laughs> many of us pay the price of not being understood. Yeah, but then again, you know, it's not just being understood, it's that A, you don't have the opportunity to express what you're doing, you know, I'm a calligrapher and I put my, I've gone to Gurdwaras and given them quotes, you know, like the Mool Mantra written out as a translation, translation, literation in Gurmukhi as well, but they're not interested, they are not just interested in promoting or that is something that's not the norm that they've been able to, that yes. they've grown up with and seen. Yes, I think that that's true. I mean, uh, my brother is in the world of design. I mean, in a pioneering generation, you know, uh, um, in the 60s. And you can imagine what that, how difficult it was for that generation where the, that, that field doesn't exist and therefore you don't understand it. I really don't know what the solution to it is too. I mean, uh, many of us, uh, you know, studying peculiar things like sociology and anthropology and so on and so forth, and artists and so on. I, I think we survived because at some level, we had quite powerful families who believed in us and who let us be that somehow you kind of managed it. But definitely there is a community ostracization. I think that people admire very clear cut disciplines, you know, like writing a book and PhDs involves very innovative thinking. That's what you get a PhD for, for developing a new idea. But what is admired is a medical thing, which is a course which you, which you have to learn. I mean, there isn't, there is an innovative thinking in that, but it is... There's a pass mark at the end of it. Sorry? There's a pass mark at the end of it. Yes, Whereas there is artistic creativity doesn't have a pass mark. No, it doesn't. So I think it's wonderful that, you know, indeed this conversation is possible precisely because of, uh, you know, the, this, this particular group. I mean, it's a very interesting development that people are into books and ideas and so on and so forth. But I, I don't know, I guess we all have to develop a platform for us and, and uh, mm. somehow buttress each other's confidence and look at creative work and be supportive of it. I don't think it, it comes from the community. I, I really don't. Oh, thank you for that. And uh, I'd like to write some of your quotes out and send them to you at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> Right, thank you, Sathvinda. Um, the next question we've got is from Beep Sandhu. Would you like to ask your question live? I think you're on mute, Deep. Deep, you're on mute. I can see your mute. Can you cut your mute? Okay. Okay. Uh, 
we'll, we'll wait, um, we'll sort that out. Yeah, let's go to the next person. Indigit, would you like to ask your question live, please? Indigit is also on mute. Indigit. This is a constant thing with Zoom. People are always on mute, including myself. Indigit, can you remove your mute? Yeah, yeah, there, there. there you are. We can hear you, Indigit. Okay. Uh, yes, one of my question is containing several points, but uh, uh, you can answer, pick one out anyway. Uh, when a migrant moves from one country to another, uh -huh. uh, faces a lot of uh, difficult situation uh, in the circumstances, because most of it will be, like you put it, the degree of uncertainty around you about uh, the cultural uh, environment that's one of the shock that you get and uh, then you come to terms with it or to actually uh, make some sort of sense out of it you want to still keep your uh, identity and uh, uh, create a place for yourself uh, within uh, the society and you go through a lot of practical, you know, issues uh, about uh, your living and about your job and about your education, everything. And for that, you need a lot of creativity. And in the process of uh, assimilating all the factors being a migrant, uh, you develop uh, some kind of resilience, as you put it, you know, and, uh, and that's what you uh, actually um, uh, make, carry it with you uh, after the time that you feel yourself a little bit settled in the new environment. So I I'm, I'm don't know what, what my question is, my, I am an artist, and I have uh, I have tried uh, to uh, teach art for a number of years, and uh, actually um, uh, given a lot of my um, uh, my knowledge and my attitude, my spirit, you know, uh, to all my students uh, uh, without thinking, and they appreciated it, you know. But uh, when I come, when I'm retired now, when I come to do my own artwork, I have shown a lot of work in my, uh, in my city here of Nottingham. And uh, I have succeeded in many, uh, many exhibitions that I took and people have come to me appreciating my work and everything, you know? And that gives me uh, a lot of encouragement and I feed on that. And I carry on working as an artist, having a studio and so on. So, you know, um, what you said is so true, you know, in, 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 your, in your conversation earlier on, and you have included the Singh twins. There, we had the honor to exhibit the work with them in Leicester, you know, myself. And uh, yes, I know what you were talking about. So thank you very much for that. Uh, th thank you for your question. You know, when you said that uh, when you show your work to your students, that it um, um, it it sort of helps you and encourages them. That's exactly the notion of shareism, and uh, you know that when you share, that you not only do you build a, a, a sort of a collective intelligence, but also this notion of uh, bridges that take us to other communities and that actually feed into our own creativity. That's the whole point of Vandike Chakra and shareism exactly that, that it actually is revolutionary when you share. I mean, the, the example that Jagbir gave, somebody knew how to cut a suit and sew a suit and somebody taught them knitting, that all that doubles the knowledge and triples the knowledge. And so it is such a 21st century, notion of the digital world, uh, which uh, some of 
us who were brought up in this particular domain, you know, it's a dominant sensibility. It's a way of being in the world. It's a style of being. And it's, and it's, it's something that's also saving people in this COVID time when there are many, I mean, the United States has the wealthiest doctors, the wealthiest technologists, but I don't see anything equivalent to the Sarbat Dapala notion. I, I don't, I mean, whilst they might have given small amounts of money, but it's not like Khalsa Aid or, or, or the SWAT, the, 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 the charity that won the award, you know, where they go and feed people all over this, uh, all over Britain. Exactly, that's the one I'm talking. So, you know, you see how people give, and these are not rich people. These are not people who want to lead a hedonistic lifestyle, which is all about give me and, and take care of me. These people are ordinary people who have enormous abilities to give to other people, to organize. When I see very rich people here from directly from India who are somehow not getting the act together to make sure people in India are getting oxygen and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, it's um, okay. I like that bit. Okay, Thank we've you. got a couple more questions. Um, uh, and there's one that I really like that I want to, to ask uh, afterwards. Um, one of the questions is from Hercharan Panessa. Would you like to ask your question live? Yes, I would. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, I think you know me. I'm Pnesar. You've known me for a long while. I know knew your mother. Uh, <laughs> so I'm from London. So well done with, with your talk. And I see you've really moved on. So my question really is, I've ordered the books. I'll be looking forward to reading it. Uh, so what do you think you'll be working on next? Um, so, uh, I think you, you, you said you know me or Jagbir's family? No, no, no. I know your family. Uh, your mom was my mother-in-law's friend. I lived in oh, Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you for that. I think, I think that what I would like to be working on next is, um, you know, in, at every phase, moving from twice migrants, uh, I, uh, you know, it's also the case that within the academy you show how you have a concept and then you develop it in different domains and there is one of the key things that I look for when you become a full professor is how you advanced your work and how it's related to where you started so that uh, so so I think what I have done that uh, f the, the very good thing for me was that my work twice migrants translated me to the United States. I got a fellowship at UCLA and that took opened up the US um, Academy for me. And so I at every stage have pushed or without me realizing the notion that I developed in twice migrants uh, has translated itself into all my other work, you know, my work on the fashion and design economies in the Punjabi suit to enterprising women earlier to immigration entrepreneurship, a book I did in California when I was at UCLA in Los Angeles, and then to dangerous designs and then to this. So I think what I want to work on next is the way in which this technical capital, I want to work more on this uh, this notion of the skill sets that these people carry. And I'm very, very keen on uh, documenting the capital that women carry and and how that is deployed and also very interested in uh, technologists and engineers and and people who make things which i touch upon in this book uh you know tejinder and sunita the two science and technology people and i think that that's a domain i want to push i would love to i would love to meet Johnny Ive and work with him on Apple products and well he's not with Apple he has his own company so I think it's that the digital domain and and uh, uh, the advancing of migrant capital okay right thank you so much um we've got a question so we've talked about the positive dimension of migration but Kulraj G has asked a question the rise of 
Um, Priti Patel, as well as long overdue discussions of anti-blackness in South Asian communities, have both resulted in critical commentaries on the politics and progressiveness of diasporic East African Asians. Is there also a more negative side to the multiple migrant journeys and success that you have talked about? You know, I, I think um, uh, indeed we don't not only have Priti Patel, we also have Rishi Sunak, both of them are. And then in the previous Baroness Vadera, who was advisor to uh, Gordon Brown and then Usha Prashar, who was head of Runnymede and yeah. has a very key position where she, uh, um, I, I've forgotten the exact name, but it's, you know, she signs off on all the very senior positions, the top level positions within, within the civil service. So I think, you know, I, I, the, the negative aspect of this is that you know, it's not the story of migrants is just not one story. And Priti Patel is is problematic for many of us, but she is represent in every community, you know, I mean, not just a migrant community. It's if you look at Americans, they've produced Trump. I mean, it's like having to deal with a monster. So I mean, it is, you know, it is, these are people all within a continent, but you can see the range of people there are from the, the presidents we've had to, to every other uh, domain and, and all the prejudices, uh, anti-blackness, the caste system. I mean, all these are things that persist. But as I, I, as I operate in, uh, within the US, they also exist amongst uh you know the uh, the the people who um, uh, uh jd vance has written about in the appellations they don't like anyone they don't want to have to you know they it's very economically depressed and they don't like any person who does not speak like them with the precise accent and so on and so forth uh, and and when i talk about these individuals i constantly refer to that amidst the enormous struggle and hard work and discrimination that our communities face. There are individuals who've emerged who somehow have been able to negotiate these difficulties. And I'm not telling, I'm not telling a representative story. I'm not telling a story that is universal. There is a point I wanna make that immigrants are more than people who just take from economies. They add to economies. And I'm, you know, I'm very, my PhD was on caste and marriage and, uh, and I'm very conscious of all those divisions which have not been erased. At every stage they've been perpetuated, but it's not exclusive to Punjabis. Ajanta Subramaniam's work at Harvard, The Cost of Merit and the Merit of Caste is all about the ways in which the Indian IITs, brand India, the golden institutions, people who come out, come out of those universities get the most fantastic jobs all over the world, are almost entirely dominated by Tamil Brahmins or Brahmins. And there is no entry for anyone else, or maybe there's one out of a thousand who manages to get into. There are all these mechanisms of policing and monitoring, uh, so that only Brahmins get in, and it's and it's made invisible. It's 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 you know power um, is often invisible, but you can see how it operates within these very high tech sectors, and that caste position is absolutely reflected. You know, Indra Nui, Sundar Pichai, Satya Nair, they're all Tamil Brahmins. Mm. So you can see how hierarchies often don't disappear, they actually re-articulate themselves and re renew themselves in ways that are both powerful, that are discriminatory and, and, and have been around for centuries. Thank, um, you so so, thank you so much, Professor Vachu. That was absolutely fantastic. And the journey of migrants and their contribution to society, this is the kind of uh, conversations we need to have more of in these fractured times that we do live in. So thank you very much for your contribution to academia in this field, but also in the wider social domain. So well, with that, thank you everybody. Um,
um, and I'm sorry that I couldn't get around to asking all the questions. Professor Batsu? Thank you so much for having me. It is, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be engaging with a, with a new generation of people and also with, a, with the world out there in a way that I often don't. You know, we all live in our little silos. And thank you so much. Thank you for the questions, the wonderful questions from uh, the various people watching all over the world. And I, there are many more things to say and conversations to be carried on. And I'm sure I've missed the nuances of some of your questions and I hope to answer them sometime in the future. We need to have, we need to have cha and gapshap. Thank you so much. And if I can just request the audience to please stay on for a few minutes afterwards to complete the survey. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. And thank you to all the organizers, the people who, we, who are behind, behind this who are doing lots of things which we don't notice. <laughs>